Starts right now. Investigators found what appears to be human remains, along with personal items, such as a backpack and notebook belonging to Brian Laundry. So those were the headlines from a brief update just about an hour ago from the FBI on the search for Brian Laundry. Very few details. Now even more questions. We begin tonight with Brian Enton live on the scene. Brian, it sounds like we may not have answers at least for another day or so. Yeah, they now have to identify those remains, Joe, which may take some time because we learned today from the FBI uh, that those human remains were at one point underwater. You have to remember this reserve was flooded for weeks and weeks because there was so much rain uh, in Florida. The flood water went down. They now discovered the remains, so we don't know exactly the condition they are in. But you mentioned it. It's very interesting because these human remains uh, were found very close to items that belong to Brian Laundry, including a notebook uh, and a backpack. Pack. Right now in the reserve behind me, there are dozens of FBI agents continuing to work. There's a forensics team uh, that arrived, and the medical examiner uh, is still here on the scene, Joe. Brian, what can you tell us about who found these items and the role Brian Laundrie's parents played and their timeline in all of this? Because a lot of people think that sounds a little suspicious, in addition to the fact that this area just opened up to the public yesterday, right? Yeah, well, listen to this, Joe. This is where this really takes a strange turn, what happened this morning. Uh, we know that early this morning, about 7 a.m., Brian Laundrie's parents, Chris and Roberta, left their house, came here to the reserve to search for their son. That's only something that's happened one time before. So they show up here this morning. According to their attorney, they alerted Northport police that they were going to do this. Police met them out here. And then Brian's parents found the personal items belonging to Brian, the backpack uh, and the notebook, and then the human remains were found. What we don't know, what's the big question right now, which the lawyer won't answer, is why all of the sudden, the day after the reserve opened, why this morning did Chris and Roberta decide they were going to leave the house, come out here, and then after a month-long search that's been happening with canine teams and drones and helicopters and FBI agents from all over the country, how all of the sudden did Brian's parents find all of this this morning? Brian, this is also where police found the car Brian Laundrie was apparently driving when he was last seen left the house, correct? So I know you've been deep into this area, and it's big, what, 25,000 acres or so. I know you've been even on sort of airboats trying to get around and navigate this. Are you familiar at all with this area that was apparently underwater before? Is that right? Yeah, underwater before much. I mean, this road that you see behind me was flooded two weeks ago. You couldn't even drive in. There was about a foot of water. Uh, so this entire swamp was pretty much underwater. But what's so strange is that just yesterday, Joe, they reopened this reserve after a month of searching and saying that Brian Laundry could possibly be there. Suddenly yesterday, reserve was back open. It was business as normal. And I went into the reserve yesterday in the same area, the same exact area where they've now found the human remains. And there there were people walking their dogs uh, and there were people hiking and mountain biking and it's just so odd that yesterday they reopened the reserve and then suddenly today uh, they make this discovery. And this is also one of the areas they searched before, correct Brian? So I, I'm not sure, I know they covered a lot of that area, but this was an area the laundries took the investigators to and said this is one of the trails he traveled, correct? Correct. This is the same area a couple of weeks ago that Chris Laundry took police to when he was um, what the uh, attorney described as assisting law enforcement in showing the areas where Brian Laundry uh, had been hiking in the past. And what's also interesting is this is a 24,000 acre reserve. It's mm -hmm. massive. There are a lot of areas that are hard to get to. This part where they found the remains and the personal items is not some far away part. I mean, it's probably 500 or 1,000 feet from where we're standing right now. All right, Brian Enton, thank you very much. I know it's been a very busy day. We appreciate the update. Joining me now for more on the investigation, retired FBI agent Bobby Chacon and Lawrence Kobolinski, forensic scientist and chairman at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Uh, Bobby, let's start with you. What were you watching today and what came out of these developments that caught your eye? 
Well, the first thing was that the medical examiner was summoned right away, which meant to me that it wasn't strictly items of, of Brian's that were found, as his attorney had said, or articles that were found, um, that there was more to it, that there were human remains. For 19 years, I ran the FBI's underwater forensic team, uh, a dive team, and I'm very used to going underwater and finding human remains and, and recovering them and delivering to a medical examiner. So to have the medical examiner on site so quickly told me that they knew what they had. Um, they had articles of Brian's that belonged to him. They had human remains. The, the conclusion could be drawn that it was Brian. Now the process is identification. Yeah, so I, I guess with your experience on that, Bobby, how, how did they miss this the first time? If you're familiar with diving, and I understand it's probably a tough job and a large area, but how did they miss it? People are wondering if they search this area. Yeah, look, you, as you said earlier, uh, this area could have been underwater. Um, underwater searches are very difficult. Unless you're in the right area exactly, um, you know, you're not going to find it. And it also matters whether the water moves a lot, whether there's storms in the area. Things underwater tend to move around a little bit. And so unless you're right on the area, unless you do a detailed grid search um, and rule out certain areas, then if you leave, you have to come back and research it. I have actually searched areas that have been very well searched and found things that were missed. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it can happen. Water does, it, it's not like on a dry land search. Water does tend to play tricks with evidence, move it around, um, and, and things can be missed. Lawrence, everyone's focused on the forensics right now. I guess the big question everyone wants to know is, first of all, when will we get some answers? How long do you think it'll take for investigators to identify these remains? Well, I think it's going to take about a day or two. There are different ways of identifying a body, dental work, x-ray work, but ultimately I think uh, they're going to resolve this through DNA analysis. <clears throat> and then it will, it, will, it will be up to the medical examiner to determine the cause of death and manner of death uh, and perhaps the possible time of death, the post-mortem interval. Right. We know that he was last seen about five weeks ago. Uh, what we really don't know at this point is the state that the body is in. Uh, there certainly will be uh, extensive decomposition. Mm -hmm. And at times, bodies can become disarticulated. Uh, and animal life will literally pull parts of a body away from the torso. Mm. That might be one reason why the cadaver dog was brought in. But I, too, agree that when you call a medical examiner into a scene like this, you know that there are remains found, either partial or complete remains. So I think it's now going to be up to the DNA experts to identify the body as Brian Laundry, uh, and then to identify the cause and manner of death in the post-mortem interval. Yeah, it was pretty clear as well when the tent went up to protect whatever it was there at the crime scene. That was an indication protected from uh, helicopters overhead, Bobby, was another indication, not to mention the cadaver dog they brought in, too. The other elements, Bobby, the backpack and the notebook. Uh, we know that these did belong to Brian Laundry. These are things that could certainly provide some answers, especially in that notebook, if he did leave anything, if it's him. Sure. I mean, he might have had, you know, a period of self-reflection, you know, out there all by himself in, in those days and weeks that he's been out there. And he may have recorded some of his thoughts in that. It would be very interesting to see. I don't know if we'll ever be uh, allowed to see that, but certainly, you know, the law enforcement can, can share that with, with Gabby's family, you know, and, 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 you know, depending on when, if, when and if he's identified. But yeah, sure, mm -hmm. I think there's going to be certain things. This is all after the fact, right? But I think that, you know, I think that a lot of answers you know, could be gleaned out of, out of that notebook if he, in fact, you know, was keeping it as a journal or was, keep, or was writing some of his thoughts down in, in these last few weeks. We don't know how long he's been dead. That'll be another interesting thing to come out of the Emmy's office if, in fact, it's Brian. Um, you know, all of this, there's, there's a lot of interesting aspects of this story. The parents leading law enforcement right to it. You know, this might have been a case where they might have known he, where he was and they were getting frustrated that law enforcement wasn't finding him. So the dad went out there a couple of weeks ago, tried to lead law enforcement closer. They waited a couple of weeks. They still didn't find him. Then tomorrow, yesterday, the reserve opens. They don't want him found by some random stranger. So they go out there again with law enforcement, and this time they find him. That's a hypothetical on my part, but it does fit the fact pattern. Yeah. Lawrence, what are the challenges now at determining the cause of death with these remains? How will they return, determine that? And, and is it possible that it may be in a state that toxicology might be difficult? And how do you determine if it was a suicide? These are all very good questions. <clears throat> you need experts 
that can work on a highly decomposed body. Uh, and with soft tissue gone, information goes with it. Nevertheless, I think there are enough uh, experts, forensic pathologists, entomologists, uh, people that know their business, forensic anthropologists, uh, they will be able to determine a cause of death and a manner of death. Uh, whether drugs are involved is very crucial because very often you try to rule out uh, things from the cause of death uh, when you don't find something obvious. So right. toxicology is very important. It's something that really needs to be resolved. But clearly the FBI is searching that entire scene in a grid search to determine if there's any evidence that leads back to the murder of Gabby Petito. Right. Because that's what this is all about. Justice needs to be served. Sure. And now we don't know what will happen. Uh, Bobby, one more for you quickly. What is the parents' role in this if, if this is him and he's dead? Does it allow them to share more or do they still risk some exposure here? Well, they do with some exposure, and that's why they have a lawyer, and the lawyer will, will advise them on their liability. But, you know, at this point, if you have a murder and you have the murderer, um, you know, I don't think the, the DA is going to be, you know, really hungry for, for a pound of flesh from mm -hmm. parents who are probably tragically caught up in this situation. Now, I'm not excusing their behavior after the fact, but, you know, they, you know, they didn't have a part in, in Gabby's death, right. and I'm sure if there was any way they could have prevented it, they would have. Lawrence, I'm up against the clock here, but quickly, if you can tell, how this changes the murder case involving Gabby. Will we get new information about her autopsy that wasn't released early, perhaps DNA, other clues that might answer some questions? Yeah, I think now that we know there, if, if this is Brian Laundry, there won't be a trial. There's nobody to try. I don't see why Wyoming law would prevent the autopsy report from being released. So ultimately, we probably will find out exactly what's in that report and how Gabby died. All right, so just a great information and insight from retired FBI agent Bobby Chacon and Lawrence Kowalinski, forensic scientist, chairman at the John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Thank you both for your time. Thanks, Joe. Pleasure. More vaccine mandates. Are the unvaccinated the new deplorables? One popular restaurant chain is fighting back. And reigning NFL MVP Aaron Rodgers takes on critics after his touchdown celebration this weekend. His response to the trolls coming up. And don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donald Report on Twitter. Remember when the COVID vaccine came out? For a lot of folks, it was a ticket to freedom from the pandemic. It certainly was for me. I got it back in April. The chance to return to normal life without fear or even a mask, it was certainly exciting. Remember those days? Others have agreed. Here's a letter sent to the Seattle Times calling vaccines our path to freedom. There's that word again, freedom. Not everyone feels the same, though. Chicago's losing more than 1,000 police officers this year to resignation and retirement, a number of reasons. It's being called a mass exodus by the police union. Many, though, don't want the vaccination. That's because while the vaccine for some was a ticket to freedom, for others, forcing vaccines, imposing heavy-handed mandates, making you get the jab, takes away freedom. In San Francisco, in and out Burger, is out of luck and for now out of business. The city temporarily shut down and fined the restaurant for not enforcing the city's vaccine mandate for customers. In and out responding this way, the restaurant posted signs about local vaccine requirements that said, we refuse to become the vaccination police. Country singer Travis Tritt has canceled shows in venues with mandates. He put it this way, mandates are trying to shame people. Mandates are trying to divide people. Let's welcome in now Max Burns, Chief Strategist of Third Degree Strategies, and Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner. Sarah, let's start with you with this Travis Tritt, Travis Tritt story. Uh, he says that people are being discriminated against, businesses are being closed, people are losing their jobs. We talked about it in the meeting today. Are the unvaccinated the new deplorables? Well, I think there's a lot of blame, especially on the left, uh, of people who are unvaccinated for the fact that the pandemic continues and that restrictions do continue, despite the fact that COVID is spreading among the vaccinated as well as the unvaccinated. They're obviously not primarily responsible for what we're seeing. But you are uh, seeing a lot of problems with the vaccine mandates in the businesses and the cities that have rolled them out individually in advance of the Biden administration's workplace rule for companies that have 
have 100 or more employees that the Department of Labor is still working on. And I think that foreshadows a lot of the problems that we will see once OSHA does roll out that rule. We saw at Southwest, for example, that enough employees objected to the vaccine mandate that, that Southwest decided they weren't going to fire everyone. Right. And I think this is something that the market has rejected because other than a select handful of a few corporations doing it in a high profile way, you don't see companies pursuing this on their own. And there's an economic reason for that. It costs jobs, it costs them talent. Uh, Max, I'll let you hit the deplorable if you want, but I'm curious about the Travis Tritt thing. He said restrictions are discriminating to concert goers, but isn't he discriminating against his fans who chose to get the shot? Well, I think the deplorable framing is right more because of how it accurately describes opposition to this vaccine mandate as identity politics. This is not grounded in law. Uh, In fact, for a party that calls itself the law and order party, uh, it's rejecting one of the soundest legal agreements in modern American history. Uh, Pandemic vaccine mandates and public health enforcement power has been very clearly laid out by the Supreme Court was uh, reaffirmed on the same reasoning just a month ago. Uh, This is not an argument that has anything but a political basis for it. Is it worth the implication, Sarah? I'll go to you on this because I thought about it today. And just over the last weekend, I was in two different airports with hundreds, if not thousands of people. And we know two million people roughly a day are traveling in airports. No one knows whether anyone in those airports is vaccinated or not. Yet we're losing all of these frontline workers who were choosing not to get vaccinated. Is it worth it? Well, it depends. In certain contexts, obviously, there's a much more compelling public health argument to be made than others. Healthcare workers, for example, who are on the front lines with people who have contracted COVID and who are at greater risk both for getting infected and also for spreading it, potentially there could be a much stronger argument made for those people to get vaccinated than some other uh, contexts in the workplace that they aren't interacting with members of the public that much, that they aren't necessarily at greater risk for spreading COVID. COVID. But I think there's really two separate tracks to the argument here. One is the legal context that Max mentioned, that courts are so far uh, upholding the right of cities and companies to implement back vaccine mandates. We saw that in Maine, for example, with frontline workers. But then there's also the social discussion about the way that people who are hesitant to take the vaccine are t- are treated in society and on social media and in the national discussion. And I think that is where you are seeing a lot more vitriol directed at the unvaccinated. It's really become very polarized. And a lot of that uh, vitriol and the blame that's being cast on people who are afraid to take the vaccine or, or who object to it for whatever reason, that is really making this more and more political and dividing people uh, along ideological lines when it comes to taking the shot, even though the shot is really based in science and, and a medically sound right. good idea. Max, you mentioned the, the businesses, and I think a lot of people we talked with have said, OK, if a business you know, puts this mandate in, I'm going to get it or I have to or I have to leave. It's the government part of it yeah. that people are objecting to. Again, to my point, what do we do if we lose hundreds or thousands of police officers, firefighters, discharging members of the military, is it, again, worth the implications? Yeah, you're right. The practical challenge of this is the real hurdle. And it's one of the reasons you've seen the Biden administration uh, over the last couple of weeks meeting with businesses. They've met so so far, I think, 40 or 50 businesses to work out how this can be rolled out in a way that supports business that isn't disruptive to employers. But I absolutely agree. I think the challenge for Biden was not coming out Uh, When the vaccine was first available with a mandate, it made it seem less urgent. Uh, And this outreach is really quite late uh, when we should have been moving for this very early. And we just showed the situation in New York, Sarah. Now we we don't even have the option to get tested there. It's either get the shot or you're out. Yeah, I think Max is absolutely right there that at first the Biden administration portrayed this as an either or situation. Either you could get regularly tested, you could continue to wear your mask, you could continue to abide by social distancing guidelines, or you could get the shot. But either way, life was going back to normal. And then when the Delta variant hit, that really changed the equation. The Biden administration sort of backtracked on that promise to people who voluntarily took the shot in a way that undermines the efficacy argument, because people who 
who were perhaps hesitant at first, but considering it, wondered why, if the vaccines protected people, there was so much pressure on the unvaccinated population mm -hmm. to take it. And so the Biden administration, the way they've handled this, hasn't really helped their argument. And now they've gone about it in what you could arguably describe as a heavy handed way, in a way that has dissuaded some of the remaining unvaccinated people or pushed them further, entrenched them into their positions. And the Biden administration faces a real challenge because the remaining unvaccinated population tends to be at this point pretty set in right. their view yeah. about not taking it. And we're down to the last few, if you will, few million, I guess, Max. But I guess that brings up the question, if we're all roaming around airports, not wondering who's vaccinated and who isn't, why should In-N-Out Burger have to be the vaccination police to their point? Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. And I think this idea of getting people comfortable with the mandate is a communications role that has not been filled by the White House. But that has also been challenged by the fact that whatever the numbers were six or seven months ago, when there were a, a decent plurality of people who had genuine concerns about this vaccine, right. the driving force of vaccine resistance now is very self-consciously uh, Trumpist, far-right individuals who see this as a political tool to build uh, a movement ahead of election time, not as any kind of public health crisis to be addressed by, by measures their voters may not like. Yeah. Well, the next battlefield, Sarah, is going to be kids. I think we can probably all agree on that. Five to 11, this is going to be another standoff, I'm guessing, right? I think you're right. I think there are, are different sets of arguments associated with the vaccinating children uh, situation, primarily because children are at such a, a lower risk than adults and especially elderly uh, people. And so it's harder to push that, both because it's more sensitive, because we're talking about young children, we're talking about forcing parents to make decisions that they may not be comfortable with, but also for a much lower risk population that has not seen anywhere near the impact of COVID on them. So while while this is obviously going to be important to, in stopping the transmission and public health experts recommend it, it's been proven to be safe for children. I think this is going to be a really politically difficult battlefield yeah. just because of those, those twin arguments, the sensitivity of it and the fact that they're not at significant risk. The next hurdle for sure. Sarah Westwood of the Washington Examiner, Max Burns of Third Degree Strategies. Thanks both for your time. We appreciate it. Empty shelves and higher prices and nearly two thirds in a new poll blame President Biden. Up next, how does that affect Democrats running for office next month and next year for that matter? And Netflix employees walk out today over the latest Dave Chappelle stand up show. Why the CEO says he screwed up. Back now to our top story. The FBI says it has found what appear to be human remains in the Carlton Reserve during the search for Brian Laundrie. Joining me now for more on this, News Nation's Brian Enton. Brian, I was curious. I know you have a huge following on social media who have been watching your every post and helping. You know, we talked about these public sleuths. What are you hearing from them about the developments today? Uh, well, it's interesting. Really, two things I would say, Joe, is what I'm hearing the most. Number one, there's a lot of sadness for Gabby Petito's family. I mean, people are reacting to the fact that uh, this could be Brian Laundry. These could be his remains, and that that would mean that there will not be justice for Gabby. A lot of people wanted to see Brian Laundry brought in alive, even Gabby's parents. We've heard from them in the past saying that uh, that they wanted to see him in a jail cell, um, based based on what they know about the case. So, so. That that's sort of one thing that I think people are grappling with, the fact that if it is, in fact, Brian, uh, that means that, that there won't be justice uh, in that way. The second thing that people are so curious about, and frankly, we are too, is, is they're questioning the laundry parents and their decision suddenly this morning to come out and search, and how is it possible uh, that, that they would be the ones to be able to find these personal items and remains five weeks into the search? So I'd say those are, those are the two top things that people are saying right now on social media, Joe. Anything from the FBI as far as an update, Brian, and when we might expect one? Have, they, have you seen them remove? moving any of what they've found there? 
No, absolutely not. We've seen more FBI agents going in just before we came on with you about 10 minutes ago. There was another uh, sort of line of cars that went in, but we haven't really seen very many people come out. Uh, they did say earlier that they suspect they will be here at the reserve investigating for several days. From the aerials, you can see that they've got a big area roped off where they're doing uh, their investigation and they've got their crime scene techs out there. Uh, what will be interesting to see is how soon they'll be able to identify uh, these remains, especially considering uh, they say that they were underwater for some time. All right. All right. We will continue to watch and wait. Brian Enton, thank you very much for the update. Some politics now. The slide continues. A new poll showing President Biden's approval rating falling now to just 37 percent. That's compared to 52 percent disapproving. Many factors playing into this, but the latest perhaps Shortages, the issue gaining traction on social media with some now tweeting pictures from stores with the hashtag bare shelves Biden. This while 62% of Americans, according to another poll, now blaming the president's policies for rising prices. Gas up more than 50% in the past year. Meantime, get this, Quinnipiac University also saying Donald Trump's approval ratings are now higher than Mr. Biden's, just barely, but higher. National Journal columnist Josh Crosshar joins us now. Uh, Josh, these shortages could continue into next year. A lot of folks seem to think that will be the case. How will that impact the midterms, and will it be uh, significant, do you think? Oh, yeah, Joe. I mean, the whenever an incumbent president has to deal with a sagging economy, with a struggling economy, it almost guarantees poor outcomes for both the president and his party. And boy, those numbers you're, you're, you're sharing, under 40% job approval, that, that's below the Mendoza line in mm -hmm. politics. That, that, that's, that signals that if that doesn't change into the next year in the run-up to the midterm elections, we're talking about the real possibility of a Republican wave election. So inflation, the economy, these are the issues that you're hearing top of mind among right. voters across the country. How long does it take, in your opinion, to turn this around if they're able to, and how do they do it? Well, look, the, the supply shortages, the supply buildup is something that they have very little control over. They, they're trying to open some of the ports in California 24-7. Uh, I, I think they need to be a little less cavalier in the tone coming from the administration. They've got to show a little more urgency, maybe get the, the transportation secretary, Buttigieg, out more to talk about the challenges and how they can be fixed. But that is a structural issue that may not be uh, <laughs> It's acceptable to an immediate fix. You, the inflation issue is, is, is a bigger bigger deal, and it's one that is in their control. Uh, you mentioned that poll uh, where about 60% of Americans think that the administration's own policies, the $1.9 trillion stimulus that was passed at the beginning of the year, a lot of voters, including for about 40% of Democrats, think that they've contributed to some of the economic challenges mm. and headwinds that we're facing right now. That's not a good sign, and it's it's sort of a red flag for Biden, who's been trying to pitch the Build Back Better economic agenda. He's trying to spend trillions more uh, in, in government money. Maybe a rewarding sign. It may not be the best idea, given that a lot of folks have some concerns about the policies that have already passed and, and may, may, as they believe, caused some of this inflation. Right. We may get a peek at at least sort of a, the barometer here in, what is it, a couple of weeks, I guess, in Virginia, where they're watching the gubernatorial race very closely. If folks aren't watching this, Josh, why should they be? Because it's a preview of things to come, right? Yeah, well, Virginia is a blue state. It's gotten much more democratic over recent years. And it's also been a traditional political barometer of what the public mood is because it always holds its election the year after the presidential race. And it tends to check the party in power, historically speaking. Um, one of the fascinating things about this Virginia race is it's not just the economy and inflation that's a big issue that's helping the Republican Glenn Youngkin do very well in the latest polls, but education the perception that a lot of these school boards have gone too far to the left, critical race theory, ideologically driven curricula, mm. that's become a very significant issue in even in a blue state like Virginia. And it's a sign that that's another issue that we may be seeing Republicans talking about down the road into the 2022 midterms. The other sign we saw of just how tense things are, we want to play a clip from a Democratic candidate, Terry McAuliffe. He actually got up and left an interview. Here's that.
He says election integrity is the number one issue. No, it isn't. Healthcare, COVID, education, job creation. All right, Nick, we're already, we're already over. Okay. All right, we're over. That's it. That's it. Hey, I gave you extra time. Come on, man. You should have asked better questions early on. So I uh, should have asked better questions is what he said there. But things have certainly, according to the polls that I saw you just posted on Twitter, have tightened up considerably. Yeah, Monmouth, one of the best polls in the country, has the race tied and even suggests that Glenn Youngkin, the Republican, may be leading if Republicans get a favorable turnout uh, on Election Day. You know, McAuliffe is, is, is a lifetime political animal. I mean, he, he's really good at, on the trail traditionally. He doesn't have the short temper that you saw in that clip. So the fact that he's gotten flustered, and I've seen other interviews he's been doing where he just seems to be a little bit off his game, suggests that he's seen the same polls, that he's someone who expected to be winning in a blue state like Virginia and, and, and maybe a little bit rattled about where, where the race stands just with a couple weeks left until Election Day. I don't know how I found it, but I found one of your tweets from back in January where you said the party that's divided is the one that loses. And I stopped on that because I thought, wow, I wonder where we are on that now, because I guess you could make the argument that both of them are. Yeah, both parties have, have their own divisions, though I will say right now the biggest issue is trying to get this uh, economic uh, plan that Pre President Biden has championed passed through Congress. And you've seen these vicious, vicious fights between Bernie Sanders and, and the squad on the left right. and Joe Manchin, Kirsten Sinema. And, and, and these are real ideological issues, real divisions that have exposed the fault lines within the Democratic Party. That's definitely playing a role, uh, not just in Virginia, but in our larger politics. The fact that a lot of moderate voters that thought Joe Biden was going to go to the middle, calm the, the heat down uh, right. politically, it has instead sided with the left in a lot of ways and, and really kind of polarize the yeah. country even further. All right, Josh Kraushar of National Journal's Hotline. It's great to have you tonight, Josh. Thanks for the time. Thanks, Joe. Joining me now for more on the ongoing hiring crisis and more is our old friend Taco Borga, co-owner and chef at La Duni in Dallas, Texas. His restaurant has already implemented robot servers to make up for the staff shortage. But uh, Taco, I, I want to start. First of all, it's great to see you again. Uh, how are things going there, and how are you oh, being? My pleasure. Yeah, how are you being impacted by the supply chain? Are you getting what you need? It is brutal, to say the least. Just to give you a little example of the kind of issues we're dealing. The other day, we got a box of to-go bags. You know those paper bags sure. that have a handle, and the bags and the handles were separated with a little bit of glue and a note that said, we're terribly sorry, we were short-staffed, do you mind gluing your own handles? <laughs> and that's just to give you a little example of the situation. Wow. We don't have liquor because the liquor uh, producers don't have bottles where to bottle the liquor. Mm. We don't have chicken because all of a sudden there's no chicken being transported from the slaughterhouse to the processing plant to our distributor to ourselves. Basically, we get what we get and we gotta be thankful for wow. it and get creative with whatever we receive not with what we order on in the timing and way that we order it Boy, so that's really something initiative and 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 creativity is the ruling force right now yeah what you do have are robots although I don't know if you can get them to glue the little handles on the bag how are the robots working out <laughs> Well, you know, the robots are fantastic because they're not replacing the people, obviously, because you can't replace people, but they are replacing tasks that makes the people either less efficient, slower, or they make them more efficient and more productive so that the poor souls that still want to deal with the hospitality industry, they get the support they needed so they can have a little breather. It is not easy. Now the ratio is 20 tables to a server when it used to be three. Hmm. And that's if you have the luck to have a few servers to fill all your schedules. Right. Now, when we talked last, you were hoping to get back to servers and do away with the robots. Are you still feeling that way oh, or are no. you going to leave them in? It, well, I wish that was the reality. But, you know, we lost about 350 employees when we had to close four restaurants at the beginning of the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And all of the ones that I've talked to, they have found a whole new career, a whole new path and a whole new way of living. So they're not coming back to the restaurants. And I don't know if that's the same situation with all my colleagues, other than the colleagues I talked to, they have the same struggle finding people. Right. But the reality is that most of them have found some new um, endeavors that keeps them happy and busy so they're not coming back to this one and the few that are still 
uh, struggling with us and, and really love to serve people, well, they're the ones who need the help. And there's right. only one way to help them. That's with automation and with robotics that make their ability to serve people better. And, and the only interesting thing is that once you take those administrative and repetitive functions out of the equation, mm -hmm. the server has more time to be hospitable than he was before because it had to do all these functions that are really not essential. Wow. You know, taking orders and bringing things to the tables are not the best use of a human mind. The best use is to go there and check how you're doing, how's your family, what things do you like, how right. can I help you? Things that before tables would get upset if a server would spend 10 minutes on a table talking to them because they were not being taken care of. And now they can do it because we're replacing all of those functions so that now the servers can do a much human activity, wow. for wow. lack of a better term. Great insight from the ground and from the kitchen. Taco Borga, co-owner and chef at La Duni. It's great to see you again, Taco. Take care. It's my pleasure. We hope to see you soon with a jar of, kai of jar cakes. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you're on. Thanks, Taco. Thank you for the score. Right on cue, Joe. Oh, man, Bears fans everywhere shaking their heads. Aaron Rodgers responds to the cancel culture mob, as he called it, after they didn't like his owning of the Bears this weekend. We'll have Rodgers' thoughts on the PC mob and more with Dave Rubin coming up next. I still own you. Those words from Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers. He taunted Chicago Bears fans after Sunday's game, clinching touchdown at Soldier Field. And now Rodgers is under fire for some of those comments, people saying they were unsportsmanlike. Yesterday, he told Pat McAfee he's blaming the pushback on woke cancel culture. There's a PC woke culture that exists, and there's a cancel culture at the same time. And it's based on people's own feelings of maybe personal miserability or dis distaste for their own situations or life or just an enjoyment of holding other people down underneath their thumb. So joining me now to talk more about this is Dave Rubin, host of the Rubin Report. Dave, I was watching this game with my dad, and after he said that, I said, this is going to be trending in about three, two, and sure enough, boom, there it was. I think the, the beauty of this was it was kind of one of those point to the scoreboard moments where he didn't need to say anything, but he did. Yeah, he didn't need to say anything, <laughs> but if woke culture and cancel culture have gotten us to the point that athletes can't trash talk. I mean, if really that's where we're at, then this thing is worse than even I thought. And I've been screaming about this for about five years. I mean, go back to any great athlete in virtually any sport. Muhammad Ali, boxing, pretty great trash talker. Yeah. Michael Jordan, basketball, pretty great trash talker. It goes down the line. So Aaron Rodgers is totally right here. You know, these guys to perform at the elite level that they perform at, it comes with a lot of energy. Sure. It comes with a lot of bravado. It comes with a lot of in your face. I want to win. And we now live in a culture that we're not allowed to be proud of anything. We're not allowed to say, oh, we want to win. We're better than you. All the things that sports really teaches us. So that's one of the reasons we've talked about it before, Joe. I don't really watch professional sports anymore because they've become so politicized. So I'm totally mm. on Team Rogers on this one. He's a guy that has been a great quarterback for over a decade now. He's still playing hard. And yeah, does it come with him being a little cocky sometimes? Sure. But if that's well, if we've lost that, I don't know why well, anyone's watching. Critics any say of this he's being stuff. too sensitive, I guess, Dave. But I don't think anybody's trying to cancel him. I mean, as he said, he owns them. He's 22 and five against the Bears. And to his point, you know, there's somebody who pays for the ticket. They can say whatever they want. If somebody's flipping him double birds, he can't say what he wants. Yeah. No, of course fan. he can. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. No, of course, of course he can. And by the way, the fans also, to his point, can do whatever they want. I mean, go to any of these games. It's not as intense as it used to be. I mean, remember back in the day, only 10 or 15 years ago, when fans were bringing all, or, all sorts of uh, placards and, and signs, you know, with all sorts of things and screaming. It's, that's been tempered down a little bit, especially the NBA, you know. They've cut down on all sorts of, you can't say anything about China if you're at an NBA game, which is very bizarre. But yeah, it goes it goes both ways and I think we need that in sports for right, sure. Dave, Dave I want to get you on one thing we just have a minute or so left uh, on the the Dave Chappelle special they had a walkout today at Netflix where are you on this and the blowback from the LGBTQ community 
absolutely ridiculous by these activists. Netflix should fire all of them. Anyone that's out there that is protesting Netflix, which is supposed to make entertainment, I which the Chappelle special was. I thought you were against people, Dave. No, well, no, no, a company. If I was running Netflix, I would fire those people. That company has a, has a job to do, which is make entertainment, not to be held hostage by their employees. They're welcome to do whatever they want on their own time. But once you're not going to work to protest the company that you work for, the company's got to do something. And I'm saying that with my director, who's right over here, and I, I'm not going to let him protest me outside of my house. All right. The issue here, Dave, seems to be that the CEO said that, you know, he didn't think the content translated directly to real world harm. That's what seemed to it bother It doesn't. Him. It doesn't. That's the thing. Nobody was harmed in the real world by Dave Chappelle. These are petulant children who are looking to be outraged. Dave Chappelle went out of his way not to offend anyone. The whole special, I would say about half of it, is him explaining why the jokes actually aren't offensive. If it is offensive to say that men and women have biological differences, then every fertility doctor in the United States should probably be jailed at this point. Because, you know, when the sperm meets the egg, uh, you, have to, you have a choice at that point. You know what I mean? They go, it's a male or a female. They don't say, oh, it's up to you. Man, okay. Dave Rubin, uh, we're out of time. And on that, we're going to have to say goodbye. We appreciate having you, as always. Take care. Okay. All right, coming up, tonight's American Snapshot. One veteran granted his dream flight when we come back. Tonight's American Snapshot, a World War II veteran takes to the air one more time in the flight of his life. Here's 96-year-old George Rittheimer, who fought in both France and Germany in 1944 and 45, getting ready to board an open cockpit Stearman training aircraft from the 1920s, something he's always dreamed of doing. The flight was organized by a nonprofit called Veterans Last Patrol, which works to bring friendship, honor, and emergency assistance to vets in hospice care. Rittmeyer said a local pilot would charge eight bucks per ride in a similar airplane when he was a kid, but at $8 a ride, he was never able to afford it. Now the 96-year-old got to fulfill his dream. Sunday, he walked away from the plane with a huge smile on his face as he said, I've been thinking about that ride for 96 years. That's our time on Balance is next.